Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Roberto Alvarez. I'm the executive director of the GFCC, the Global Federation of Competitive Competitiveness Councils. We are a global multi-stakeholder membership organization. Our members are corporations, universities, government agencies, and private sector councils, industry, commerce, chambers, and alike. So those four segments. Combining our members and fellows, we have a footprint in 35 countries. Today, we are here for a session, a webinar, about our Driving Innovation in Times of Crisis initiative that was started with Japan Science and Technology Agency. We'll have three moments in this discussion. We'll first introduce the session, then we'll have a series of micro cases, and we'll have a round conversation at the end. I'll get back to you with more about the session dynamics. To get us started, I want to invite you, Deborah. Deborah is the president and founder of the GFCC. She is the president and CEO of the Councilman Competitiveness and someone who has been seeing innovation from a privileged standpoint throughout the years and who has done a lot of work, not just about innovation and competitiveness, but also resilience. So Deborah, thank you so much for being here. I want to turn to you. Thank you, Roberto. And let me second your warm welcome to our distinguished uh, guest, our panelists that will be introduced shortly, and to all of you joining. Um, I want to start by thanking um, you, Roberto, and Shimada-san for your co-vision in conceiving this very important initiative about innovating out of crises with resiliency at the core, coming out of the work, actually, that we did all together on Frame the Future the key drivers and pillars of competitiveness being innovation capacity, sustainability, resiliency, partnerships, and inclusivity. This is a very, very exciting initiative and a lot of research has gone into it and will be an anchor for work of the GFCC going forward. Um, I want to just briefly say, because I know we'll have a discussion, that the US Council on Competitiveness actually began to look at enterprise resiliency as a framing capability for every enterprise, every community in the aftermath of 9-11, but also as a core driver for productivity and economic growth. And we did some seminal studies on enterprise resiliency with our GFCC chairman, Chad Holliday, who at the time was the CEO of DuPont. And we refreshed that work as we all uh, dealt with the crisis of COVID-19 and the impact on our societies, our institutions, our corporations, and all of us as individuals. So we have a long history in this, and we're very excited today to, to learn from our distinguished panelists, friends and colleagues, supporters of the GFCC, Rogerio Studart, Jerry Holton, and, and Jonathan Philippin. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Roberta, because we want to have time for hearing our, our case studies and discussion. Thank you, Deborah. Um, as Deborah said, Shibata san this was only started because Frame the Future in the engagement of Japan Science and Technology Agency. So I wanna to turn to you, maybe to share with our audience here, our colleagues who are joining the session, why is this a relevant matter, matter for a leading science and technology agency in the world? Uh, thank you, Roberto, and thank you, Deborah, for your message. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and start discussion with GFCC members about crisis and innovation. Um, many people supported us to build foundation of our upcoming discussions. I would like to appreciate GFCC research fellows, John and Loon, and as well as Dennis, Chris, and Hayashi Sensei from Japan to put their huge efforts on the research of past crisis. And I I do not raise names, but thankfully many experts, including Jerry here, were available for interviews. And I also appreciate professional coordination and GFCC team to realize this wonderful job. And the world has changed a lot in the least 2000 years. Uh, throughout history, we have continually evolved our society by responding to and overcoming crisis. And Japan faced the big challenges of the Great East Japan earthquake, and we are still dealing with it. The COVID-19 pandemic hit us hard too, 
and we are still feeling its effects. Uh, for more than two years, I've been working with the GFCC team and uh, thinking about how scientists and tech experts can help in each, can contribute uh, to such situations. And uh, uh, at the heart of our endeavor lies a crucial distinction. A crisis is not the same as a disaster. And we need to see not only the problem right in front of us, but also the potential for it to spread across countries, fields, and boundaries, and even bigger trends. And learning from past experiences, preparing for crises before they happen, and turning them into chances to make our society better are key. Uh, that's why JST is uh, strongly committed to this project. And uh, science and technology are a part of all of this, but it's not just about them. We also need to think about the bigger picture beyond just Japan. Our outlook must embrace the broader global context, uh, one that transcends the lens of any individual nation. So in this regard, the GFCC serves as an invaluable platform. In, uh, enables, uh, it enables us to engage in a cross-cultural dialogue with visionary leaders from diverse uh, corners of the world. It's great to sharing our thoughts about crisis and learning from what happened before. And more importantly, it's a way to build trust and plan together for a better future society. The months our GFCC research fellow spent research have equipped, with, e equipped us with profound insights into historical crisis. Armed with this knowledge, we ready to start discussion with you about the uh, uh, prospective crisis uh, that lie ahead. And I am excited to leverage the outcomes of this research to invigorate meaningful discussion and actions. In conclusion, let me embrace the lessons of history and our current global interconnectedness. By collaborating together, we have the potential to transform crisis into stepping stones towards the future defined by greater resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, shimada -san. Uh Let me quickly do two things here, provide you some background on this initiative, driving innovation in times of crisis, and also review the, let's say, our session here today. As Deborah mentioned, in 2021, we had a major initiative called Frame the Future. In that initiative, we explored how we could leverage innovation, sustainability, resilience, partnerships, and inclusiveness through competitiveness strategies. And Japan Science and Technology was a major partner, and they highlighted resilience as a key topic for our community to work together on. In 2022, as Shimada Sam mentioned, we started a series of joint works, conversations, some online events, some open closed door e events, a variety of discussions. So we will share here with you on the chat uh, a few resources that emerged uh, through the time, like uh, things coming out of Frame the Future, but also the web page for our Driving Innovation in Times of Crisis initiative. We, over the years, have um, so really came to this conclusion that we needed to advance the concept, but also draw lessons from past crisis. We really started this because of the support this year of Japan Science and Technology Agency that has enabled the GFCC to involve researchers from Queen's University, Belfast, the University of Auckland, and the Kiev National Economic University as researchers in this project including John Katsus, who's here today with us, Ailun Gu, who's not joining live because it's 2 a.m. in Auckland uh, at this point, and Denis Ilinitsky from the Kiev National Economic University. We have studied, really tried to advance the concept. We had a workshop with our community in April, on April the 25th. During that workshop, we collected insights about the concept, but we also prioritized the, some of the cases that we could highlight in this effort. What are those cases? 9-11, the COVID-19 crisis, and the global financial crisis. 
we have developed some research related to 9-11, the COVID-19 crisis, and we're getting ready, thanks to the engagement and support of a key contributor to this project, Chris Allen from the European Commission, to advance and to come, what will come next is the global financial crisis case. How is the session organized? We have this introduction, and as part of this introduction, we have Ilun and John sharing a bit about what they have learned about the concept, some of the learnings of the micro cases. Then we will have three guest speakers, one talking about 9-11, Jerry Houting, John Philippon, who's in London, will talk about COVID-19, and or Jerry Studer about the global financial crisis. Each one of them will present quickly, and then we will have Q&A, a conversation um, about each one of the cases. And we will have a final round of discussion with our free guest speakers, Deborah, Shimada Sam, and John. Having said that, uh, Vanessa, can we pull the video here uh, that Ailun has sent about what she has learned and the key developments about the concept and some of the things that she learned about COVID-19? Hello, everyone. I'm Ailun. I'm Ailun. Going to talk about the challenges and insights from our research about the definition of crisis and the key lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic case study. It's a challenge to provide a definition of crisis as in academia and industry. The terminologies emergency disaster and crisis are used interchangeably and in combination. On the other hand, they are differentiated to refer to different timelines or scales of influence. Thus, there are no universally standard definitions for each term. The definition depends on the context and the discipline. To drive innovation in times of crisis, we definitely need a clear definition that can lay a solid foundation to facilitate our understanding of crisis and tackle future challenges. Through extensive literature review and discussions, we define crisis as a recognized period of increased danger, requiring action to limit severe and cascading consequences. Due to its complex nature, we think crisis is an umbrella term whose scope is broader than emergencies and disasters. It's a recognized period of increased danger and the consequences must be systemic and transboundary. Next, let's look at the key lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic case study. First of all, early recognition of the crisis is the key to an effective response. Any denial or delayed recognition by the government or the public would make the situation worse. Secondly, multi-sector collaborations among government, nonprofit, private and public organizations, and community groups play a critical role in response to the pandemic. Legislative, administrative, and institutional flexibility is the decisive factor in the pandemic response. For example, the rapid rollout of vaccines and distribution of PPE wouldn't be impossible without such flexibility. We should maintain open communication, both top-down and bottom-up, as it enhances public awareness and self-discipline so that we can build community resilience. We need to strengthen preparedness through R&D and infrastructure to better prepare for and respond to future crises. So that's the preliminary results we got so far. Thanks for listening. As, as I told you, Ailun is in Auckland. It's 2 a.m. there, so uh, we, we got a, this video from her. I think um, she mentioned something critical that a crisis is a social construct, right? It really depends on the context. And having said that, I want to turn to you, John. You, um, Ailun is, her PhD was about COVID-19. She's part of the faculty at the University of Auckland where she's a postdoc. And you, John, you've been working at the intersections of business, international work policy and organizations for several years looking at some crises. Why, with your work at Queen's University of Belfast, but also the American University of Georgia, you've been, you've been privileged to see mm -hmm. things happening on the ground and study that. Considering that, and what do you have done in our research? So well, what are the learnings and what, what would you like to share? Thanks so much for that introduction, Roberto, and, and good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, yeah, I think what's important for us to do is 
in ilunanized research, <clears throat> we saw a few individual cases. Ilun talked a little bit about our definitions of crisis and then a little about COVID-19. Right now, I'll just talk briefly about the innovations that we found in our research, our interviews, um, going through archival footage and interviews of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, and talk a little bit about what we saw in the crisis. So this was a crisis marked particularly by widespread and global fear, unprecedented damage in a major global financial center, and the ignition of a two decade long conflict against Islamic extremism. So on September 11th, when Al Qaeda terrorists launched a catastrophic attack on not only the governmental and military capitals of the United States, but also the commercial capitals of the US, it's led to the death of almost 3000 people with over 25,000 people injured. And it sparked and was first really recognized according to our interviewees who are really at the decision maker level. It really sparked once the second plane hit. There was an immediate recognition that this was a coordinated event. There was the possibility of not only other hijackings, but also other attacks. And as I noted, recognizing that a crisis is there is critical to responding to it in an innovative way in order to avoid more consequences. So that establishes the pathway forward. What we saw with the 9-11 attacks was radical innovation in sectors like air travel, finance, national security, and perhaps most dramatically in the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. In the airline industry, the attack showed gaps in global airline, uh, global air travel security and its economic implications. Through the introduction of measures like biometric technologies, fortified cockpit doors, and strengthened global coordination efforts, they were able to restore confidence in air travel despite what were pretty widespread initial fears and economic threats. In finance, the attacks highlighted the dangerous potential for exploiting the global financial system by terrorist groups. So to combat this, the global financial regulations were tightened and instituted globally, often for the first time, and enhanced technologies were adopted globally to detect and report suspicious financial activities. We've seen this then used in subsequent crises like the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Similarly, the need for global coordination and national security also became apparent. Nations teamed up with intelligence agencies and there was improved intelligence sharing, policy synchronization, and joint counterterrorism operations. And technology was crucially leveraged for things like advanced capability, advanced predictive capabilities, data analysis, and surveillance. And then finally, probably the most dramatic innovation on the policy side was the creation in the United States of the Department of Homeland Security, which brought together 22 different federal departments and agencies and had them for the first time sharing best practices and enhancing security efficiency and effectiveness. So the grim events underline the need for innovative crisis response. And it demonstrated that crises while challenging can also serve as catalysts for growth resilience and improved readiness to confront future threats. Thanks again, everybody for joining. And I look forward to hearing everyone's, uh, as particularly Jerry's comments on 9-11 in a bit. Thank you so much, uh, John, for your work, your smart and for being here. Um, let, let's turn to the second part of our session. And I want to invite all the colleagues here who are attending, have your questions ready, share those on the Q&A feature here. We're now transitioning to Jerry Houting. Jerry MacArthur Houting is a distinguished fellow of the GFCC. Jerry served as the Undersecretary of the Navy in the United States. He was also the president of New York Polytech Institute, which was merged into NYU. Jerry has been working in the space of technology and innovation for various years. He is now the chairman and founder of Global Futures Group, which really supports technology development across nations and has been working with colleagues in various parts uh, of the world. Cherry, you had a privileged, let's say, seat in terms of seeing the effects, but also acting in the aftermath of 9-11. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. I think you are, you are muted, Jerry. Thank you, Roberto, and uh, hi, Deborah. The uh, I'm glad to uh, I was uh, to my surprise at the uh, center of the uh, attack in New York, and uh, uh, just briefly, I had been in the Pentagon from 1993 through nine to 2000. I moved to New York City, or actually Hoboken, on the west side of the Hudson River, 
was dean of a business school that overlooked the city and could see the World Trade Center. And actually, the president of the university saw both planes uh, hit the tower. Uh, so there we were in the midst of an attack on the physical structure downtown with all of its devastation. Uh, as we recovered from that, we began to look around to what else was vulnerable. Were there other vulnerabilities? And one that we looked at immediately was the port facilities of the city of, of New York and New Jersey. It turns out that we learned as we did our studies on this that the food supply and the fuel supply in New York City is about two to three weeks long. That means that if you can't resupply, by the second to third week, you begin to run out of food and run out of fuel. Uh, the, the region is about 40 million people, so the consequences could be very devastating. Uh, so we decided to do a simulation or war game of an attack on the port. The other thing that you begin to realize immediately is when there's been a crisis, you can motivate people to do things that you can't motivate when it's a hypothetical threat. So if before the attack on the towers, if I proposed a war game on the port security, no one would have come. They would have said, impossible, not a big deal, don't worry. So the, you move from hypothetical to real, and that's a powerful motivating force. The other thing is you begin to break up old power structures. And here's what we saw. We can we begin we assume the port of there's a port authority in New York. We assume they had control of everything. Turned out there were 39 agencies, governmental offices, private sector organizations, and others who had some role in the security of the ports of New York and New Jersey. So we convened all 39, and lo and behold, they didn't even know each other. They were trading business cards, they were trading phone numbers. Uh, what do you do? So we learned soon that we needed to create a new network of communication, uh, which we did. Uh, out of that simulation came a network exchanging information. In the beginning, it was emails and phone calls, and then it moved up to a much more sophisticated network. Two is uh, we decided to anticipate what could be future threats, so we gamed out what we thought were the likely ways of attack on the port. If you read our, there's a study, which I think the GFCC has and will distribute, but you really, you see, we exert, we ex cut out the 10 likely attacks because it was basically a blueprint for a terrorist to decide how to attack the port. So you do, you do this, one thing you do learn as you begin to prepare for threats is you begin to identify vulnerabilities and those turn into uh, assets for your enemy. So you do have a sort of tension between, well, how well do I identify our vulnerabilities? Are we actually turning ourselves into a target? So a, a crisis and this response, uh, it gets very complex. We learned, did learn one other thing, which was interesting, at least in the United States, and that is we have a federal government, state governments, local governments, private sectors, there was an enormous amount of dysfunction between these levels of government. Uh, and we played that out enough that they began to realize they did not know how to relate to each other. They needed some protocols. Uh, the good news is uh, we've been 20 years since 9-11 and we haven't had a major attack on the port. So uh, we uh, learned a lot. We made a lot of changes and a crisis allowed us to motivate that change. I'm ready for questions. Terry, thank you so much. John, I want to turn to you to, to lead the discussion here with Cherry. And for those in attendance, please share your questions and please count on me as a resource, uh, John. Thanks so much, Cherry. I mean, we, we've talked already, so you were one of, you very graciously donated your time um, to, to contribute to the, the case study that we did on 9-11. I wanted to focus on, on, at first, something you mentioned that other interviewees brought up. So another interviewee referred to it, what you did as red teaming. So having a group, either internal or external, that's really committed to providing a different approach. 
and to saying why things could go wrong, what vulnerabilities are. That it could be vulnerabilities in a security context, or it could just be someone there basically providing a, a less than optimistic view of how to approach things. Do you do you find that that approach has worked in other contexts, um, and and have you seen it work in other uh, responses to either this crisis or to other crises? Uh, well, John, I. I've often said in speeches that there should be an 11th commandment, which is there shall be red teams uh, because they're necessary to find these vulnerabilities. But it's a it's a surprisingly difficult to be a good red team. There were studies done in 1997 that said New York City was vulnerable or the air system was vulnerable to attack. Uh, they didn't resonate. They didn't get attention. Uh, this is this problem of hypothetical problems don't get a lot of attention. Real problems get a, get enormous attention. In some ways, it almost pulls you in the wrong. It can pull you in the wrong direction because you then focus on well, air security is the whole deal. Well, there are other problems. Uh, so I do though believe in red teaming uh, and then listening to red teams and responding to them. But it's surprisingly difficult without the crisis to motivate behavior change. And then linked to that, how do you see bureaucracies or larger organizations being able to make sure that they take those lessons from crisis and don't forget about them? So we heard from some of our interviewees telling us the crisis was great and then we fixed everything and then we seem to have forgotten. Right. There's all these lessons that we learned, that we instituted, that we did things, and then slowly they're being rolled back. So how do you see in your approaches and what you've seen in your leadership, in uh, your leadership positions, how an institution can make sure that they maintain those innovations that come out of crisis? Yeah. Well, after 9-11, another project that I helped lead was a uh, response of the business community to create a, uh, it's called a resource bank and a database of available resources if there was an attack on New York City again. And so that meant where is extra supplies of food? Where could you house people if housing was uh, destroyed? Uh, okay, right after 9-11, lots of interest. We solved a lot of problems of coordination. We masked it all up. By the third to fourth year after 9-11, interest wanes. I would say now that organization doesn't exist that database probably isn't around anymore. So there, there's a real fall off. I think it's almost inevitable. I mean, all that work is very expensive. And when you don't have an attack over the next five to 10 years, because you think you've solved the problem, why are you spending all that time quote, getting ready for the attack when it doesn't happen? It's back to this problem of hypothetical problems are hard to prepare against and real crises motivate behavior. I, I, so I'll let Roberto go, but I think there was a question in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, that's what I wanted to call your attention. Um, so the question comes from Gene, and Gene asks, "Does this call for a different kind of change management?" And I would I would add, "What would that be?" Yeah. Well, the uh, we all, or many of us, are involved in efforts to predict the future, uh, scenario planning, red teaming. Uh, I think it's a it's a part of uh, the great part of our society is that we do this and we anticipate and we get ready. Uh, it's a, an important function. It's difficult to do. And it's the problem of let's say I'm I'm in Ohio and let's say, you know, I prepared a plan to keep tigers from killing people in Ohio. Well, there's two problems. There aren't any tigers in Ohio and no one's been attacked by a tiger, but they could be. Uh, so you you create this, there's a problem. People say, no, nah, it doesn't exist. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult paradox. And uh, as a result, you need to uh, game and think about these problems. And then you need to either create historical analogs that says, look, it, this is equivalent to what happened at 9-11, therefore we need to prepare. Uh, it's very, I want to argue, it's very difficult. And because it leads to such expensive efforts, look at what we spent on air security. To have done that without ever having a major attack, 
almost impossible to spend this kind of money. Great, thanks so much, Jerry. I'll turn it back over to Roberto. Thank you, thank you, Jerry and John. So let, let's turn to our second micro case here. I know we have another question of Abdul Aziz, but let, we will address that um, at the end of her session. So I wanted to invite John Philippon from Queen Mary University, London. John is a senior lecturer in, in health systems uh, there. You've done research in clinical settings in the UK and in South America. You are leading research today with partners in Latin America and Brazil, in Greece, in the United States. And in doing that, you have a, a variety of um, positions with Queen Mary. You are part of the global, the global Public Health Unit at the Center for Public Health and Policy. You lead the Masters in Go Global Public Health and Policy. You are also part of the coordinating team of the Working Group on Political Economy of Health and Healthcare. And for those who do not know, Queen Mary has one of the largest health systems, or it's a big health provider, operates different health units in the city of London. So John, I imagine that you, you, you were deeply involved in trying to understand, to follow, and to make sense of the response to COVID-19. So what could you share? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the really kind invitation, Roberto, and in the name of uh, compl uh, complimenting you, I say hi to everyone. Um, and our, listening to, to Jerry, I, I am now a bit like skeptic uh, because I think we are kind of in the first years shortly after uh, the big crisis in a way uh, and you can actually feel some of the attention kind of weaning down <laughs> and it, it is really really worrying but anyway so uh, personally speaking uh, in terms of uh, you know what I was doing uh, in, in, in when uh, in a way not when the planes uh, hit the, uh, the, the World Trade Center but in a way when uh, we really realized that this was a, a, a global health uh, uh, problem or a global health emergency. Uh, th that was literally my first year uh, ahead of the MSC in global health uh, and we just had to in a way, carry on as best as we could. So my main role in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, my my uh, um, uh, work at the university was to pretty much uh, help students and staff to uh, uh, to carry on their their uh, uh, their work. And mostly we we were supporting a lot of students who were uh, somehow socially isolated. So we have most of our students are international students. Uh, and this was one of the, the, the main aspects. We can discuss, uh, Roberto, if you if you like, uh, you know, the kind of neat and greet uh, of uh, uh, some of the actions that we did in terms of health services and, and health systems, uh, uh, you know, in London and, and also my, my main area of research is in primary care and access to health. And I can share some of those with you. Uh, but I would say that the key here, and it's interesting to see because I mean, I've never studied 9-11 uh, yeah. as, uh, as a crisis, right. but I've been but studying think... crisis uh, pretty much throughout all my academic career, but in a way, crises that have an effect on health systems. So, uh, you know, the crash of 29, the two world wars, uh, the oil crisis of the 70s, all these, they have a direct effect on uh, health systems. And they pretty much, and in a way, they, it's interesting to see the name of these webinar, uh, you know, the crisis that shaped things. Uh, I would say that the crisis shaped how health systems are today. Uh, and I'll give you a, an interesting example. We have uh, the NHS, so the National Health System in the UK. It's a direct result of a very specific moment, historical moment, which is post-World War II. There was a social consensus uh, around the need to rebuild, not only physically, but socially speaking, uh, the UK was uh, uh, not in a good state after the war, socially speaking. Uh, so people were uh, suffering from really, really basic needs, housing, uh, inequality. So 
in a way uh, 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 slightly different than what we have today, and uh, but uh, also with some interesting similarities. But there was an, an overall consensus, and from do, from that social consensus, you have the welfare state and the NHS. So it's interesting to see uh, and and to lis listening to Jerry, I, I can definitely see uh, how crises they uh, open up. And in, in, in policy studies, we, we call these policy windows, or you know, some people might call it opportunities. Uh, I am really, really uh, uh, reticent to treat access to health uh, from a market perspective for obvious reasons. I study political economy of health, and my uh, uh, what makes me wake up in the morning is to study ways to uh, eliminate the barrier to access health and healthcare. Uh, and the fact that we have the NHS that in a way virtually eliminated that barrier uh, so people can access uh, healthcare without any barrier. And that was, uh, uh, in a way, a result of a crisis. It's an interesting aspect. Uh, and uh, in a way, uh, 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 also linking with what Jerry brought uh, uh, and he mentioned up, we introduced people that were actually working in the, in the same space in the port, but they actually never met. In our case, I would say that services have been working side by side for decades, and suddenly they discovered that there was WhatsApp, uh, and this was literally in the first lockdown. Uh, and it's interesting to see uh, a health system uh, like the NHS, but pretty much any health system is what we call a hierarchical system. So you have primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and uh, the way that people uh, kind of navigate this system. We've all been there. Yeah, we've all been to a GP. We've all been to somehow in need of uh, of healthcare. Uh, the communication is really, really not the greatest thing that happens in a system. And it was interesting to see because of need, uh, there was a lot of communication and a lot of improvement from that. So a lot of networks were established after uh, uh, the 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 first uh, years. Uh, sorry, the yeah, I would say the first year. Some of it is kind of uh, uh, receding, and it's it's really sad to see. But I would say that the key aspect, two main messages that I wanted to to convene here. One is communication, definitely that uh, has uh, changed a lot, uh, and. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the second thing was to realize that we can actually absorb technology a lot faster than uh, we thought that we could. And that is also a key learning curve for, uh, uh, for health systems. Thank you again. Thanks for, for the invite, the very, very kind invite. Thank you. But thank you, John. Um, oh, there has been a lot of talk about the, in, let's say, the national health system in the UK recently. Right, I think throughout the years, but a lot of stress was put into the system because of COVID-19 and there's a lot of talk about the current situation. What was learned from the COVID-19 period? As you said, we have not overcome that yet, right? It's, it still is going in some way, right? But let's say what was learned from the peak moment, right? Um, what, what are some of the learnings in relation to the health systems, health operations, but also, if you could extrapolate that, what have you learned that you think that people should know about crisis in general and how to accelerate some of the, some of the improvements of innovations that you mentioned, communications, tech absorption? Um, I might be stepping in a little bit on to the 2008 economic crisis, which is your next uh, uh, um, case study. But that was my main uh, uh, field of you know, research and study around uh, crisis before COVID. We, we looked a lot and tried to learn a lot from what happened uh, uh, in 2008 and, and the follow-up. Uh, and I would say that one of the things that came out of that was austerity. And it was interesting to see uh, in COVID that suddenly, uh, not that there was no austerity, but actually the, the issue maybe wasn't actually resources. It was actually how you distribute them and how you allocate resources, which is an interesting aspect. The second thing uh, that I think COVID uh, really, really brought uh, uh, forward, uh, and I would say not only for health policymakers, but for, for policymakers in general, uh, is that a health system doesn't exist without people. 
it's interesting to think about that, but uh, there there is a layer that is made of human beings, and sometimes, you know, policies and and policy reforms tend to somehow overlook that. Uh, so you you really need to look at a health system as a system made of people and for people. So without the workers, <laughs> there is no health system. So I think that is an interesting uh, uh, lesson. Uh, that is still there. And uh, you've mentioned that the NHS has been, uh, in, in a way, uh, COVID made things worse. I will have to, in a way, uh, disagree slightly because I've been studying the NHS. That was the, the actual reason that I actually moved into the UK was to study the NHS uh, because it's the biggest, uh, uh, not the biggest from in terms of size, but it's one of the main universal health systems uh, in the world. Uh, and when you when your main concern is universal health care, you need to look at, uh, at the NHS. And uh, what COVID actually brought forward uh, was actually to highlight processes that were already there. Yeah, so for example, the main crisis in the NHS is workforce. Uh, it was already there. It just made things a lot worse. So it's like uh, uh, when you are you know, a, a student and you are trying to uh, use a highlight uh, a pen, trying to get the key aspects of a text, that's what COVID did with uh, uh, the main aspects of uh, or pro problems of a health system. It kind of highlighted really, really strongly, but they were already there. It didn't bring a new thing. And that's part of, uh, uh, I think, one of the things that we, we should look at, that maybe both <laughs> the problems and the solutions were already there. What the crisis did is just kind of put all <laughs> into the spotlight so we can actually look and, and think about that. What we do with it, it's an interesting uh, uh, discussion, I think. Yeah, and, 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 and what Jerry brought us, uh, it really made me think because that's exactly what's happening now. Uh, it seems, I was reviewing a few texts uh, for this uh, talk and uh, most of them are from a year and a half, two years ago. So it's it looks like people are not necessarily thinking about this anymore, but it's literally just uh, uh, kind of around the corner. Yeah. You, you, you just mentioned something that we have during COVID, we had an initiative, we, we gathered leaders from the GFCC community and we published a book as a result of the conversations and the insights that we gathered, uh, leading for the chasm. So Simone, maybe if we could share here on the link, because you mentioned about the crisis being a highlighter, that's one of the concepts that uh, I think we captured there. But one question for you that we got from Jim here on, on the Q&A is, is there a way that thinking about health systems that you could map, you could create a systems map of vulnerabilities, right? And could address those in advance, what would, what would you advise about that? That's an interesting thing. Uh, one of the, the aspects that we have discussed not that much, and we should have actually discussed that better before COVID, was something called health systems preparedness. Uh, and this became, in a way, for the last like two or three years, uh, a, a big field of research. Uh, and it's interesting to see that some people were already actually looking at this, uh, at this field. Uh, but now it became a bit more uh, central, let's say, to, to, to the concerns of policymakers. Nothing happens without resources, yes. So uh, again, uh, research and development into this, uh, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at resources for research allocation uh, and, and, and where resources go, public health is the least funded uh, areas in, in, in biomedical research. Uh, and uh, it, it really gets your, your uh, you know, it gets your attention there and, and, it, 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 and somehow explains sometimes why the response was so slow, uh, things were so confused. Um, I mean, the UK government was an interesting case study to show how things were really, really unclear from the policy perspective. Probably now, uh, things would be a lot quicker and a lot more responsive. Uh, but at the same time, a crisis is not a crisis if it doesn't bring you something that hasn't happened before. So. You know, how can we be prepared for something that we don't actually know that will come? <laughs> so from 
a, a health systems perspective, and that's the only thing that I, I can tell you, uh, mm -hmm. is to keep a health system extremely strong. And when I say extremely strong, is from a coordinator, co coordination perspective. So to have an NHS, it means that you will be at least halfway through the good response. Yeah, if you need to kind of... Uh, uh, improve your system when the crisis hit that's too late yeah it's mm -hmm. it, it's gone already so you will suffer yeah so the fact that you have uh, mm -hmm. a, a, another interesting example is is brazil in terms of health systems uh, the fact that they have a, a, an nhs even if it was suffering uh, and it's been suffering from underfunding from uh, many from many different issues uh, in, in in latin america but it literally saved life the fact that mm -hmm. it was there the system was there, and, and mm -hmm. even if the crisis was something fairly new. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. So get ready. Be fit before you have to run. Um, uh, Rogeri, I want to transition to you. And John has mentioned something that made me remember Edith Penrose. You are an economist. It's not just about the resources, but how you use that, right? Um, so, um, Rogerio, you were a board member with uh, very important multilateral organizations, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank. You come with a background in finance, in economics. You've been involved with various nonprofit organizations around the globe. Even if you started your career in banking, you, you moved into policy and the nonprofit world. You've, you've seen the global financial crisis from a privileged standpoint. So thanks for being here. I want to turn to you. You are muted, Rogerio. We, we, we cannot hear you for, because of some reason. Right? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, we have a technology crisis now um, in real time. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, let me start by thanking Deborah and you for this very kind invitation. It, it, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. So many good friends, and it's a privilege to be with this panel. And I already learned a lot from the, I don't think I have a lot to add, but let me tell you a little story here of uh, the, how I saw the crisis. Actually, uh, uh, I, I want to correct online um, 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 a factual mistake that I made in my interview. I joined the World Bank. I was at the IDB, at the board of the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, and joined the World Bank in 2007. And, uh, and that was in July 2007. Uh, the president, uh, President Zalek was just joining. President Wolfowitz was leaving. And what was the discussions that we had there? We had the bank that was uh, uh, losing uh, relevance very quickly. Uh, the lending, the, the net lending has been, had been negative for a while. Uh, there was a discussion of how to, to, to increase the lending capacity, uh, discussion of recapitalization of the bank. Uh, so it was all about what the bank could not do and how to stretch the balance sheet. Uh, the, the crisis, of course, uh, it started exactly at the moment that I had, was joining the bank. There was a, a discussion. I, I mentioned in the interview that we had a retreat uh, of the board in 2008. Actually, it was 2007, if, some, if somebody can correct that, uh, because it's important in terms of timing. I was, raised, I was trained in, to be as, as a financial economist, uh, international finance and uh, macroeconomist. And by the way, I changed, I reinvented myself to be a climate change economist for reasons that I, I may be able to talk about a little afterwards. It has to do with crisis and, and, and risks. And the, in 2007, that retreat, the, there was a presentation at the IMF and the World Bank economists saying that everything was okay. Uh, I had the same uh, thing in the, the US, uh, the Brazilian embassy at uh, yes, Washington DC, and being a Keynesian and a Minskian, a, a follower of John Maynard Keynesian of Hyman Minsk, I was looking at the numbers and I was looking and I said, no, this is, this is very likely to become significant. Even though the subprime uh, 
uh, market was small, relatively small in the beginning, and it spread through the systems because of the interconnection, just like what Hyman Mies, for instance, would have said. And I raised that question that I was shocked by the reaction. The reaction was, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and actually I felt at that time, maybe I'm missing something here. Uh, I was not missing. I think that the, what happened in 2008 proved that, and uh, like many other uh, economists were saying that this was uh, you know, a big, big crisis that was going to spread really quickly, particularly because it was in the center of the international financial markets. Now, what happened to the World Bank was really surprising. I mean, to the World Bank at IMF. I mean, out of the blue, we discovered that we could lend much more. We could be more, much more proactive to crisis. The lending capacity out of the blue was taken out of discussion. Uh, no recapitalization immediately. And the bank was lending almost twice as much, particularly for trade, uh, which was blocked. The trade finance was black and blocked immediately. And, and for mid-income countries, with, there was a discussion where the mid-income countries should be phased out from uh, lending of the World Bank. So, uh, and then of course, uh, there was a lot more of cooperation. There was uh, the governance structure, you know, the G20, uh, G20 became a presidential forum. Uh, the World Bank became uh, you know, much more active in this uh, collaboration between partners. And then came quantitative easing, okay, with Obama particularly. Uh, when you discover an easy way out of the crisis by just pumping money into the economy, and once that happened, very quickly some of the key actors uh, forget about forgot about uh, you know everything that had been done. Uh, you know the other countries got uh, mid-income countries, some mid-income countries create a new uh, uh, institution which is the BRICS, and then very quickly we had. We, we, we went back to business without, you know, even remembering what happened. So my main uh, uh, lessons are very similar to what Jerry and Jonathan said. Uh, first of all, we, we tend to address uh, crisis quite well, not risks. Risks we deal with very badly. Uh, uncertainty, not even black swans, it, it's, you know, we, it goes into chaos. Uh, from the point of view of what it was, governments and financial institutions respond, again, respond to crisis, particularly when it's, it, 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 they are mandated to do that or they need to survive in order to do that, uh, not much to risks. Uh, innovation will occur. Some are positive or they are negative, I mentioned two, uh, but uh, very quickly they will be dropped once there is a sense of normalcy uh, in the system. And the third one, which we need to, and I know that I have surpassed my time, but is that if we have, uh, we, we, the lesson that I take is that in order to address the multiple crises now, we have to be much more vocal about the lessons that we have. But I'll stop here because I want to hear uh, questions if there are any. Thank you, Rogerio. Shimada-san, I want to turn to you to, to lead uh, the conversation with Rogerio. Yeah, I want to apologize. I have a very demanding uh, puppy here next to me that is crying <laughs> for attention. And that's what, but uh, if, if you hear noise, it's, it's him saying, I'm here. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, Rogerio, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I found a question on the chat from Dennis about how we can recognize, uh, um, uh, recognize the crisis. And also, Jerry and uh, John also mentioned about it is very difficult to uh, uh, share uh, the sense of crisis among the people. And uh, um, yeah, in GFCC, we will now discuss the crisis we face. And if it's a if it's a known fact that people tend to lean towards optimism even for those who are sufficiently insightful and experienced, uh, can we not continue to act in the midst of crisis without uh, feeling pain? Uh, what are your insights and effectively confronting reality? Uh, do you have any ideas on that? Well, I could say no. Uh, but I'll try. Okay, uh, uh, I don't. I don't think that p 
people, it, it's a matter of survival that people tend to become, uh, tend to be optimistic in some parts. In some other parts, because you become a pain in the neck if you are too pessimistic. This is the reality, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Keynes, German Keynes used to say that, you know, it's like, it, it, it's a hard behavior when, when to say, hey, I think that we are marching to, to, to a crisis very soon, uh, the, as described by, by, by a, a wonderful book that I like, The March of Folly. Uh, there were several occasions where society marched to, to crisis and without, and the, 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 the elites did not change the course, even though they knew about it. Because politically and financially, uh, in, in uh, business-wide, it's not good to say there's going to be a crisis. You prefer to be, be, believe that you're going to be the last one uh, to leave uh, the room before it collapses. Uh, so I'm, in that sense, I'm very pessimistic. Look at what the situation that we have now. We have a climate emergency, we have geoeconomic fragmentation, and we know it that ended in the past century. Uh, we have a very quick, uh, quickly rising inequality. And we know what that hand uh, led to in many uh, uh, crises since the French Revolution. Uh, so we have all these tensions, and we know this is very likely at a point in another result show crisis. What can we do about that? What are we doing here? I think we have to be vocal about it. We have to dare to say that is a huge probability of crisis and you do nothing. Unfortunately, when it comes, for instance, to climate emergency, just to make sure I have 20 seconds, uh, uh, only the youth have been doing that very uh, loudly around the world. I think we need more voices. We need to join forces with youth, just use this, this specific issue. And that's all we can do, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shimada San for sure. Thank you so much. We have we have a few more minutes. And I really want to turn to you, Deborah, for comments and reflections. I know Jerry has a, a comment too. And then we have a, a, a final round. Hey, B, uh, I was gonna just throw on the table science fiction should probably be inserted in this discussion because science fiction. <clears throat> often can dramatize the risk and cause people to believe it's a significant factor. I, I, I want to agree, and let me recommend a book, which is The Ministry of the Future. Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. should read that book. It's science fiction, but it's very grounded, very well grounded in evidence. I, I, I echo Rogerio. Deborah, over to you. Yes, thank you all. This was fantastic. And I want to also thank our researchers, uh, John Katsos and Elaine Gu and the others uh, who have worked so hard on this work because it is in our initial report. A couple um, overarching comments and then I know we'll have a final round, but one of the things that Gu said that I found really, really fascinating in the beginning and then it carried through in all of our discussions in her uh, outline of what, you know, the, the lessons in crisis and resiliency is she, she talked about the increased danger requiring action to limit severe cascading consequences. But I think an insight here is that the cascading consequences are nonlinear. And we've seen the impact in the three crises described of things that occurred, responses to things that occurred that were ancillary to the core, but had huge profound impact in both dealing with it and shaping the stage for the future. So that is something that's a very, very important um, insight. And of course, now we see with some of the new technologies and the pattern recognition, modeling and simulation, the ability to map and understand nonlinear um, impacts is very, very significant. And I think it will be very helpful in the, in the future. The other um, comment I wanna make is we haven't talked too much and we'll get into this about the exceptional role of individuals. We've talked a lot about institutions and society's response, but we saw whether it was in Fukushima, 9-11, COVID, and even now, you know, and I don't know as much on the financial front, but the role of individuals and how they stepped up and did things that they probably were way out of their comfort zone, but had a huge impact 
in changing the trajectory of immediate response and outcome. Um, and then the other I want to just throw out is, you know, so much of our focus on economic growth and security, but very much on the economic growth and the innovation has been around cost and efficiency. And we prioritize that over resiliency and security. And I think some of the fragmentation and some of the new conflicts that are emerging also have a relationship back to these three crises where countries, institutions, people really felt we have to take care of some things in our own backyard and we can't be dependent on others. And so this whole issue around rebuilding critical supply chains, having capacity, um, Jerry mentioned the very significant issues around the food and energy challenge in New York. And you would add to that, of course, Jerry, water. I've heard you talk about water, how long you have without you know, water, much less than the food. So that, that's something I want to um, bring out. And then um, I think we have some test beds now, uh, Shimada san and Roberto that we really need to address. Um, obviously the, the climate crisis and you know that's a case where it is being seen, but a lot of it is not seen. And so is it real to some and not to others? But the real crisis that's, that's very much at the fore and we have not learned our lessons from are two, the fire crisis, the wildfires that occurred in Greece this summer, roads in the interior of Greece, and then of course, Maui. I mean, you, everything you read, the preparedness was not there, the response. I think Greece in many ways has done a better job on this than the United States did with Maui. And then the other is the immigration crisis. What's happening in a city like New York? prepared for the immigration. This is true in the UK. It's true throughout um, the parts of the world now where people are moving and the immigration crisis is real and we don't have the systems to deal with that. So those are a few things I want to highlight. And, and I know we have a short period of time here, but I think our panelists were superb and the work to date has been outstanding. And finally, um, I'll just make a comment about uh, Queen's University. I had the opportunity to be at Queens for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Accord and talking about the crisis and innovating in a crisis. Queens University was a great innovator in sectarian conflict, which was a huge crisis in Northern Ireland and the Republic in the UK. And they created the safe place. They created the communication networks. They created the place where lots of the toughest negotiations and people we're able to come together. And that's a very, very interesting case study as well. The social crises, the social resiliency that comes from innovation and how we do things and how we engage with people. Deborah, thank you so much for your insights. I think that your, your comment about cascading consequences in a not linear way, it's, it's fundamental and really, yeah, I think the work that John and I learned, they developed that concept, um, for the, the crisis concept. So thank, thank you, thank you, John and I learned for, for, for the work. But I think there was a fundamental input, Deborah. And you, you raised several super relevant uh, things here. And I think we'll, we'll have a chance to explore some of those when we have our next session too. But one thing, um, maybe we could go for a final round. But before that, we have one. We had one question here from Paul made in UK, right? Uh, who's there in, in Belfast, Deborah? And Paul was asking for one specific type of question, uh, uh, one specific type of crisis. The, those slow moving crises, they're not bounded by one single event. They grow slowly to the certain point when, he, when you recognize there is a crisis, right? So Paul was, was asking um, about that and how, um, how can we motivate people to deal with that type of crisis? So I want to turn to that to all to you to see if John, John, Jerry, Rogerio would have a comment about that type of crisis. Any insights or comments? I can I can try. Uh, 
let me first make a comment. I could not agree more with Deborah on so many things and, and, and summing up of also her insights. Uh, one thing that I have a question in my mind and that, it, uh, that again is going to turn to your, uh, this question that was made. I think this idea that we have had that we cannot count on others to do some, uh, some issues is problematic because more and more, uh, we, we, it's not a question of counting on others. There's no way of addressing the crisis that we have without counting on each other globally. I mean, the, the, what is happening in Canada is affecting the United States. What is happening in, in Central America is, is, is affecting uh, the, the United States. Name it. Even what is happening in the Amazon in Brazil nowadays is going to have a huge consequence for the globe. Uh, now, this is, and again, Roberto, with about your questions. How do you address, this is the typical case of the boiling frog. I'm sorry if the, you know, all know the story. Uh, we have to be very vocal about this. We have to say to the world, I mean, we are reaching a point, uh, a tipping point on so many things. And there's no way that we can say, oh, I'm going to deal with this within my own borders because that's, that's the only way we can do that. We have to denounce this. I mean, for the sake of, this, not only this generation, but for our children and grandchildren, we have to say it. We have a significant debt uh, at, with the future generations. And this, it, 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 that cannot be repaired if we do not act uh, jointly right now. And this is my final comment. So, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Terry. Uh I agree with uh, Robert, uh, Rogerio, and I wanted to add, I think that uh, anticipation and prevention are certainly worthwhile uh, in terms of crises, but it's very difficult, as we've discussed. I think the concepts of resiliency and self-healing systems uh, is this, the alternative that says you, you won't prevent the crises from happening because it's almost by definition something you couldn't see because it catches you off guard. But if you've built systems that are resilient and can be self-healing, they then can recover from the crises quickly and the damage is limited. Uh, a good book on that would be uh, Nassim Tlaib's book, Anti-Fragility. I mean, he's famous for Black Swan, but Black Swans are hard to predict. Uh, Anti-fragility, though, is the idea that you build systems which aren't fragile, systems which can repair themselves. And uh, so I would lay that on the table, and I think it's worth exploring. Okay. Um, let, let's do like a quick final round here. But before that, Deborah, you mentioned something else about the role of individuals or leadership. When we had our Now Region Reboot series and we published uh, Leading Through the CASB, uh, one of the lessons that we captured, we heard very well, was that leadership matters. So uh, again, there's another connection, and thank, you, thank, you, uh, thank you for reminding everybody about that. Um, I, I took notes on a few things about innovations that you mentioned. So accelerating technology into the market, into applications, breaking boundaries, um, changing limits of things that we can do communication and integration of teams, areas, whatever, and raising the awareness about risk, things that in some way were innovations in crisis context. So as we go for a final round, my question to all of you is, what is the one recommendation that you could give people in policy, in business, to innovate, having those things in mind, without needing a crisis? How, how, what would you suggest? Who, who wants to go first? John? You can, oh, oh, Deborah? I wanna go first just because I wanna build on my earlier comment because I think you know we really have to recognize and applaud through the crisis we've discussed today and the others that are underway, you know, where people took responsibility for themselves and their families and their neighbors. One of the, the worst things that came out of COVID, I think, was the recognition of how fragile it is when people are alone, when they're isolated, when they don't have the networks of human support that throughout history, 
we have had as human beings. We're social creatures. And so I, I think this resurgence of interest in communities and places where people live, I mean, the inequities that came out through COVID were very stark to me because here you had people such as ourselves that were working remotely, we were connected, you know, and then you had people who never worked at home. They were there on the front line, getting people supplies, food, working in the hospitals. And that was a huge social issue. In addition to the fact that, you know, healthcare for medical, uh, mental health, all of these things sort of took a back seat and individuals have to step up and take responsibility working with their governments, whether it's at the local, regional, state, and national level. I think we have a tendency today to say, well, the, the, the government has to solve and do all these things. But at the end of the day, it's all of us too have to be part of the solution and response. That's my final comment. <laughs> and thanks thank, to everyone. Thank, thank you, Deborah. For sharing. Well, I'm going to... <laughs> I think that one way to react to, to, to these issues is to think inside the box. I mean, my, the lesson that I take from, from crisis is that sometimes the solutions to, to avoid crisis and, and to mitigate crisis are right in front of you. And we, and, and, and we tend to think, oh, that's some solution is going to come for climate change. Look at all for, and, and for inequality, the solutions are well known. So think inside the box, look at the state and be vocal about what will happen if we do not use the, 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 uh, uh, the tools that we have in front of us to address uh, the potential crisis. Thank you, Rosario. Jonathan. Hi, thank you for, uh, the, the, those were really, really nice insights. So uh, I would say, and probably linking with uh, what Deborah and Rogerio just said, uh, I would say that the biggest innovation of all uh, is to actually look at your side and who, uh, to, to look at who is around you uh, and, and to really communicate with whoever is your community in order to deal and prepare for things. Uh, so really, really, in, instead of uh, relying on the usual structure, the usual hierarchy, that we have, uh, we really need to kind of re remind ourselves that things should be a bit more horizontal in terms of uh, uh, the same uh, effect uh, that you have uh, in a crisis. Uh, it's not only you know your street, your neighbors. You might be watching something on the news that will have a direct effect on your uh, own life. So until we don't realize that, uh, it will be really difficult to to understand that. <laughs> Uh, the let's say the big innovation uh, and and that's I, I would say that one of the key things that happens and, and came out of a uh, big big crisis like the world wars was solidarity and it seems something so so simple and so simplistic uh, from a uh, from an academic perspective but it's actually <laughs> that's what actually make things uh, a bit more prepared and uh, and and uh, uh, a bit more let's say uh, innovative so maybe you know the, the 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 disruptive innovation here is to actually remind ourselves that we are all <laughs> human beings and we need to think about things that will not only benefit yourself but also uh, uh, the others uh, around you. So thanks a lot for for these really really interesting uh, insights and and for the invite. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Jerry, how can we do that? You are muted. First thing, we need to unmute. Right. Uh, I'd say two things. One is uh, after crises happen, we've talked a lot about how to respond and innovate and the factors that take care of that. Mm -hmm. And I think those are important to catalog. And it's a good uh, crises are opportunities because the old system's broken and you can reform in the middle of crises and get to much higher ground. And we've seen that happen. Uh, look at the response in terms of COVID and the development of uh, new vaccines. I mean, they just came out of the market like this because we had a major reason to do it. That science had been going on for, what, 20 years. Uh, so that's one. But before crises, that's the tougher spot because they are very difficult to see. By Almost by definition, there's something you didn't see. 
Uh, and here I would just put two things on the table. I would put red teaming. We've talked about it already. And secondly, I would put net assessment. I mentioned it in the chat. But net assessment, the concept that you look at all factors and try to anticipate where the vulnerabilities are can be very productive. The, uh, the US, the Pentagon had a, uh, a hero who did that for 40 years, Andy Marshall, and he solved a lot of problems uh, and anticipated problems that we solved before they ever happened. And of course, it's hard to prove you solved, you avoided a crisis because it didn't happen. Uh, and so you don't get credit for it, but it didn't happen. Uh, so anti-fragility, net assessment, uh, resiliency, I think are really important to avoid crises crippling you. Thank you, Jerry. John, over to you. Well, what would you recommend? You've been working with crisis, you've led research in, in this project. So, yeah, I'd say in listening to everybody today and over the last, I would say, decade and a half, I've done thousands of interviews with business leaders, government leaders, all experiencing crisis or going through conflict zones. And the one thing that came through today and comes through from those interviews is something Peter Drucker talked a lot about in the context of innovation, which is we have this sense that the innovator is the lone wolf who is some genius who comes up with the innovation. And in reality, the innovations are done by groups of very humble people who approach things in a way that sound a lot like what Jerry and what Jonathan and Rogerio are mentioning about red teaming things, about looking for solidarity and opportunities for community and understanding that individuals are not the ones with the answer by themselves, but rather everyone has those answers all together. And so what I guess I would leave everyone with on my end is, is Peter Drucker used to use uh, these, these two questions, these two split questions that I ask all my interviewees when we talk about innovations, which is what went well that you thought would go badly and what went badly that you thought would go well. And I think both of those expose the sense that you, you can't be stuck on an idea just because you promoted it or because you had certain expectations on it. You have to remain humble and work with and work with others in order to innovate out of crisis, um, but also to make sure that those innovations stay in the institutions and the organizations that you're a part. Thank you so much, John. Shimada Sam, over to you. A final word. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is not my uh, thought, but uh, from the Science, Science Council of Japan, uh, I I learned from uh, the. Uh, from the report of the future report of the Science Council of Japan from Professor Hayashi. Uh, the international collaboration helping each other is very crucial uh, to be resilient because if we focus on the certain region, uh, crisis is very rare. But we, if we look at the global situation, we can find many crises around the world. So we can, in order to, in order to avoid the uh, forgetting problem, uh, we can, we should uh, corroborate each other. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shimada-san. Everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, something that really went well, but I expected that. We got amazing insights, comments, examples, and suggestions from all of the folks here on the session. What, what didn't went well was time management. So that's on me. Uh, we are behind schedule, but I think it was a great session. Please uh, stay with us because on October the 27th, we're talking about the next crisis. That session will also be part of Science Agora. That's the main science festival in Japan. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, Shimada-san, for creating that opportunity. Stay tuned. Before you all go, our speakers here, we have a GFCC tradition that's to take a group picture that comes from the uh, ancient, ancient age of COVID-19 when we were doing things online. But I would ask everybody to turn their cameras on. Uh, Simone, if you could do that. And yeah. So again, Thank you so much, Jerry, Rogerio, Jonathan, Shimada-san, Deborah, and John, and Simone, Vanessa, and Eleni.
who made this session possible. Stay tuned, October the 27th, check for updates on the GFCC website. And as usual, you get emails and reminders from me. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Roberto. Thank everyone.